Welcome to She Persisted. I'm your host, Sadie Sutton. Every Friday, I post interviews about mental health, dialectical behavioral therapy, and teenage life. These episodes break down my mental health journey, teach skills to help you cope with life, and showcase testimonials from individuals, including teens just like you. Whether you've struggled yourself or just want to improve your mental fitness, this podcast is your inspiration to live a life you love and keep persisting. This week on She Persisted. A lot of us have wounds from childhood or from earlier adolescence that we haven't attended to. And it's sometimes not until we've fallen in love with somebody that we're like, oh, shit. Oh, yeah. I've got serious trust mm-hmm. issues. I have actually a really hard time regulating my emotions. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I don't know how to ask for what I need in the bedroom with somebody who actually mm-hmm. loves me and is like, I want to feel good with you. I want you to feel good with me. And so sometimes it is in falling in love that we get really confronted by our yeah. own stuff. This week's DBT skill is the GIVE skill. This is a skill from the Interpersonal Effectiveness module. And when we're approaching interpersonal interactions, we can prioritize our goal in the interaction, we can prioritize the relationship and improving the quality of the relationship, or we can prioritize our self-respect. So GIVE is the skill you use when you want to improve the relationship. So this acronym stands for Be Gentle, Act Interested, Validate, and Use an Easy Manner. So diving in deep here, being gentle means not attacking, you're not making threats, you're not judging, and you're not sneering at the other person. You're being very nice and respectful within the interaction. Acting interested, you are listening and you appear interested in the other person. So you're listening to their point of view, you're facing them, you're giving body language that shows that you're paying attention to what you're saying. And another thing to add here is to be sensitive of the person's wish if they want to have the discussion at a later time and being patient with that need. Validation. You are validating with words and actions. You are showing that you understand the other person's feelings and thoughts about the situation. You are trying to see the world from the other person's point of view and say and acting based on what you see from that view. And lastly, use an easy manner. If this means sprinkling in a little bit of humor, smiling, easing the person through the situation, being lighthearted, and letting go of any attitude you bring into the interaction. So that's the give skill. Amazing to improve your interaction. You can use it in any relationship dynamic. And even if you're just using one part of the skill, it is hugely effective. Hello and welcome to She Persisted. My name is Sadie. I'm your host. If you are a new listener, I'm so glad you're here. Make sure you subscribe and leave a review so you don't miss out on any new episodes. We have an amazing interview today with Dr. Alexandra Solomon. We talk all about body acceptance, sexual health, sexuality, relationships, healthy and non-healthy relationships, so many amazing topics that are relevant to any teenager who interacts with people. But before we dive into that, this episode has had me thinking a lot. Ever since I sat down with Dr. Solomon, I think two weeks ago now, I have been examining my own relationships in my life, where I want to improve relationships, where I'm feeling a lack of connection, and I feel like this signal just keeps popping up in every area of my life. I was listening to an episode from Alexis Haynes' podcast, Recovering from Reality, and she was saying that we grow in relationships, and so that quote kept sticking with me, and in this episode, Dr. Solomon and I talked all about how relationships are what you invest in them and what you put into them. And I've noticed, especially since I've been at college, I've kind of taken a backseat role to growing and improving my relationships. Yes, I am socializing. Yes, I'm interacting with people. But I've been so focused on building a foundation that supports my mental health, which I love. I'm so proud of myself for that. College is truly my home and it is an environment and routine that energizes me and allows me to get everything done that I need to get done and feel good doing it. And I feel a lack of the amazing, deep, authentic relationships that I was able to build and sustain at home and at other points in my life. And so I've noticed that I've been kind of navigating my relationships through the mindset of like, oh, they'll just like pop up and appear. Like they'll just magically form and this connection will happen. And that's not really the case. It's accumulating moments of vulnerability and authenticity and asking people to hang out or spend time together and continuing to build those connections through different interactions. And I think that's something that's really important to remember. And when I think about that, I'm like, oh, that really sucks. Like relationships just magically came into our lives and there was immediately that super strong connection and foundation that would be amazing, but that's not the case. And that's not to say that connections don't form authentically and naturally, but you're still putting energy and effort into that by being vulnerable and expressing interest and concern about the other person and spending time together and all of these different things. 
So this is an area that I'm currently really working on in my life to grow and improve my relationships and allow myself to grow more because I don't know if anyone can relate to this, but I've gotten into this headspace where I'm extremely effective at navigating my life without the without dealing with interactions from other people. So like I could go through every single day and like be totally fine, like my mental health is stable, my emotions are stable, I don't react in a big way to anything, like I'm healthy, I'm happy, I c- I'm content. But I'm like very stagnant at that point of growth, like I'm not being pushed out of my comfort zone to be vulnerable and express what I'm feeling and understand my emotions and validate other people. And so I have a twofold question if, if you guys relate to this. One is, do you kind of constantly feel that urge or that d- need to continue to push yourself and grow and up level with your relationships and your life and being effective and being skillful? And the second is if you can relate to that feeling of being really effective internally, but it's at a deficit because you're not as connected within your relationships, if that makes sense. Like you're really good at navigating things internally in your little bubble, because that's comfortable and relationships push you outside of your comfort zone and force you to have conversations and interactions that are out of your control. And it's so worth it. It's so amazing to be connected and validated and understood and seen. And there's the discomfort that brings that amazing result. So all of this to say, this is an amazing episode and something that just has stuck with me. And I know it will stick with you as well. And I'll keep updating you on my growing relationship project aspiration and how that goal is going but I think the messages in this episode are so profound and powerful and every single person can relate to it. So without further ado this week's guest is Dr. Alexandra Solomon. She is a licensed clinical psychologist that specializes in families, marriage, and relationships. She is a professor at Northwestern University. She has two books published, Loving Bravely and Taking Sexy Back. She just launched a new podcast called Reimagining Love. You guys should definitely check that out. She's also super active on Instagram and social media. So you can follow along with her at Solomon. And I, of course, will link her information in her show notes as well as her website, which has an amazing blog, which she references in this episode. So if you have any questions about anything relating to relationships, or resources. It's probably on her blog. So I'm definitely going to link that as an amazing resource for you guys to dive into. But without further ado, this episode is so amazing. I know you're going to love it. Let's dive in. So thank you so, so much, Dr. Solomon, for joining me on She Persisted today. I'm so excited to have you on the show. I'm happy to be here with you, Sadie. Thank you for inviting me. Of course. So I have so many questions to ask you today about adolescent sexuality. We're going to dive into relationships, how teenage and adolescent relationship and sexuality exploration impacts adulthood, tips for parents, so many things. But I wanted to start Mm. super basic with the messaging that gets directed at teenagers for both girls and boys. And what's the difference here? Because it's obviously something that's super profound and super relevant to all teenagers, even before we dive into relationships and sexuality. So just starting starting with messaging around relationships and sexuality, what happens there? Oh, my gosh. Well, I think that you are, I mean, unfortunately, we do have to kind of tease apart the intersection of gender and sex, which is so sad. But the research has found that nowhere, like in in no other domain of life, are gender role expectations as rigid and narrow as they are around the whole realm of dating and sexuality. So there really is, we can't, unfortunately, we don't live in a, what I would love to do is move our culture to a space where we're just talking about sexuality, right? About just living in our bodies, experiencing pleasure through our bodies. But unfortunately, everything remains quite binary. And all of the folks who live outside of the binary are like, hello, you guys, yeah. like there's a whole bunch of, you know, a whole bunch of ways that y'all are trapped within these binaries that limit things, limit your experience, limit your expression. But I think that you are right to start us off by saying that we socialize our boys and our girls quite differently around sex and in, you know, equally problematic though different ways, right? And that I think that we teach the messages that we get, I mean, so much to say right here, but so many messages to girls are about their value being in how they are, the degree to which they are desired 
by boys, right? While at the same time that their bodies are dangerous and distracting when we think about school dress code rules that are either you know, implicitly or explicitly around covering up your shoulders and your legs mm-hmm. so as not to distract, distract boys. There's a very, you know, the message there is that your body's dangerous. Your body is also an object, right? It's your kind of- job to control so that others can experience calm and not just be distracted and all of that. That's right. That's right. It's a really wonderful book called Pure by a friend of mine, Linda K. Klein, who grew up in evangelical Christianity. And it's a beautiful book. It is part memoir, part research. And she basically talks, like breaks down all this stuff, like the explicit teachings within Christianity, which are not just within Christianity, mm-hmm. but the explicit messages. Like you're like you literally, woman, you are a stumbling block. You are a thing that men have to learn how to manage and navigate. So the least you could do is cover yourself up. Crazy. To make their- Crazy. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Because, well, because then it fits right into the messaging we give to boys, which is that your boys, your sexuality is so wild and so out of control Mm -hmm. and so aggressive and so reckless that the only thing we can do is save the world from you. Which is a horrible message because what men, what what we all crave around the whole realm of the erotic is so much more than like power and control, right? Our authentic, our authentic, our authentic sexualities, I believe, are incredibly loving and connected and present and mindful and caring, right? So it's just as dangerous to teach boys that that urge you have, yeah, that urge is totally dangerous rather than being like, that urge you have is so natural and so normal. And here are some things you can do to ground yourself, to refocus yourself, to channel that energy into your art, into your music, into movement, right? Mm -hmm. And that then when you do partner with somebody for a sexual experience, that you partner in really, really attuned, careful, tender ways. Do you agree, Sadie? Does that land with sort of your your experience of gender role socialization around sex and it's it's so complex like we talk about gender as a spectrum and it's even just when we boil it down to talking about males and females there's a complete opposite sides of that spectrum as far as the messaging there and it's so interesting how one is like you need to you need to control you need to for females it's like you need to make yourself appear in a way that's digestible for other people and for males it's almost the same it's like you need to tone this down this needs Mm -hmm. to be acceptable all these kinds of things and there's not that message of compassion this is okay we're here to support you during this transition that's just missing on both sides which is which is crazy to think about and so that Mm -hmm. goes right into my next question which is talking about self-compassion and the the connection between body acceptance and body image and females and and sexuality as a whole and kind of how that is intertwined and what's your perspective there oh my god well so i mean so deeply entwined right so deeply yeah. entwined in ways that are so really heartbreaking right so if we've been given you know, this idea of, you know, the way that oftentimes girls come into their bodies, like I think there is a chapter of our lives of when we just lived in our bodies, right? Yeah. We just like lived in these bodies and we were like fascinated by what they could do and what how, where they could take us and what they could do. And then there is, for some people, it's like a sharp turning point. For some people, it's an erosion. But then it becomes this awareness of like, oh, actually, shit, everyone around me has opinions about my body. And there's all these ways. And we start to like pick our bodies apart that these parts are too big and these parts are too small and these parts should look more like this and less like this. Or we, you know, all too many of us survive a trauma where our own sovereignty over our bodies is robbed from us in, a, in an instant, right? Yeah. And so in any of those experiences, in all of those experiences, we lose that sense of like, inside out experience of our body and it becomes an outside in experience of our body and that completely compromises our ability to experience pleasure and presence and orgasm so when we look at the research you know there's a significant orgasm gap that stands out most when a man and a woman are are having sex together right women who are making love with women tend to be really likely to have orgasms and there's there's not a lot of gap there men making love with men really similar high likelihood of orgasm really like reliable orgasm but when a man and a woman are making love with each other the mm-hmm. chances of her having an orgasm especially i mean the 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 like bullseye of like nothing's going to happen is a woman hooking up with a man in a hookup, right? Mm -hmm. Like a non-relational, which makes total sense because in order 
for her to experience. And again, pleasure and orgasm aren't necessarily the same thing, but orgasm is certainly we, we can use it as one metric that, mm-hmm. that people feel safe and present. And but that that if she's in a hookup experience, she's it's probably pretty unlikely that she feels safe. Yeah. Pretty unlikely that she feels no able to give connection at all. Yeah, yeah, and the and the and there's a question like, are you open for my feedback? Are you mm-hmm. here with me? If I if I tell you to please slow down, if I tell you I want more of this, like, will you be able to? And so, I think that I worry sometimes about the early because so often girls and guys early sexual experiences are hookups, so they can mm-hmm. kind of become then the template of like, well, I guess that's all sex is, you know? It's yeah. like not that not that radical. When in fact there's so much to be explored, but it has to be explored in a foundation of trust and mutuality and care, which certainly can happen in a hookup, but all too often there's a lot of drinking and kind of just like not a lot of emotional safety. Mm-hmm. But tell me tell me how that lands for you. I, I think that makes a ton of sense. And my next question was really kind of just looking to understand how sexuality develops in teens. What does that process look like? What are the different markers that teens experience? And and what is that development that they go through? And I think that's really interesting to look at it through what that norm is for early sexual experiences and how that narrative is written for what teens think sexual experiences will look like for the rest of their life and how that can impact their beliefs about that. But yeah, so development throughout teenage years of sexuality and relationships. What is that what does that look like? Well, that is an, a huge question yeah, it's that a people big one. spend an entire <laughs> entire career breaking mm-hmm. down. But some of the thing, you know, northern the northern European countries give us a really cool counterpoint to American sex education. Mm-hmm. American sex education is so bad. Completely... There's an amazing John Oliver episode about sex ed in the United States, and it's just hilarious because he brings up all of these different clips of people that go into schools and how different the different things you'll learn are and like all the different metaphors that are used, whether it's like a piece <laughs> of gum or a dirty sock. And it's That's just right. comical. Like I'll link that in today's show notes because if you want to laugh and also to be like, wow, there's a big problem here. That's that's the episode for you to watch. <laughs> if you want to laugh and also cry. Yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I was giving a workshop to like maybe a hundred therapists and we were talking about this very issue mm-hmm. and I had them break into small groups and kind of tell each other the story of their sex education. Mm-hmm. And we came back together and one woman was sharing and she was, I mean, she was in her 20s. So she was a young clinician in her 20s and she was educated in the public school system right here in the you know, North Shore of Chicago, where we mm-hmm. like pride ourselves on being so progressive. It was a public in a, in a public school setting. She had right. The teacher came in with two gift bags, and one gift bag was like very lovely with the glitter and the tissue, yeah. and the other gift bag, like she had like rolled it in the mud, like run over it with her car, crinkled the tissue paper, and she's like, "You have the choice of which one of these you want to give to your spouse someday." Like what? It's like. There's my tax dollars hard at work. Yeah, no, it's literally <laughs> it's in, it's insane and it it's just again, laughing and crying at the same time. You're like what is going on and this is so yeah. terrible. It's just the craziest craziest thing. Right. So what we did was I was like, okay, everybody, like let's all like put our hands on our heart and like we just like sent some like collective love and healing to the 15-year-old girl yeah. that she was when she sat there and was like Holy shit! These are my only two choices. Like I just and felt so you're being forced to be sad in sex for ed. Her. These teens are like, oh, this is so uncomfortable. This is so awkward. Right. I don't want to be here. Like, oh, all around, right. such a bad experience. That's right. That's right. Yeah. That's oftentimes, you know, I teach this marriage one on one class at Northwestern, and when we talk about sexuality, I, you know, students have said to me over and over again, like, this is the first time I've ever heard like a grown up, even though college students are grown ups yeah. as well, but I'm, I'm more a grown up than like they are. Kids still. <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's right. Which is so so wonderful. I love. I mean, I always want to have part of my career being on a college campus because it just keeps me connected and engaged and fresh. I so that. I love that like cross-generational conversation. But anyways, many of them will say like, I've not ever heard like a grown-up person talk about sex the way that you just talked about sex. Like in my mind, a talk about sex is a talk about pregnancy or diseases Mm -hmm. or shame or risk, right? So that's – so there's as much to be learned So as I want your listeners to be reflecting on their sex education experiences and what was said and then also what wasn't said. I think there's a huge part of like how we heal ourselves, which is like 
giving ourselves the sex education we needed. I had a student write a term paper, a queer student write a term paper where he basically wrote the sex education he wished he would have had and like gave it then to his young self because if you are, yeah, if you're LGBTQIA+, it, there is a single digit chance that your sex education showed any kind of representation of your yeah. sexuality. And if your parents gave you like the talk – Mm-hmm. They likely gave you the talk on a kind of sex that you're probably not going to be interested in having, right? The and talk especially is like the huge emphasis on pregnancy prevention and birth control, like that in itself is messaging towards the LGBTQ community that just it's it's not it doesn't fit. You're not seeing yourself represented. It's 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 very interesting to observe. That's right. And then so then by default, by having that not spoken within that silence is I'm the other, yeah. right? I'm the other. I'm not here. I'm not represented. So I must be different and different oftentimes in our minds then gets paired with shame. So it's not just different, it's deficient. Mm -hmm. So that, so then, then healthy sexuality becomes like a reclamation, something people have to fight for or something people have to restore rather than like, what if we just gave people that at the beginning, right? So there wasn't, because it does. I mean, you're, you know, part of your question was like, where does that go in adulthood? Well, where it goes is that I spend the other part of my week working with couples who are struggling with significant sexual issues because not because sexual issues are so difficult, but because they become impossible to work on if you have no language and if you have no have not had practice talking about sex or wondering together about sex or if the idea that different equals bad and wrong, then when my penis doesn't behave the way that I think it should or you know, I don't get aroused in the way I think I should, then it becomes like, oh my God, I'm broken or you're broken or we're broken rather than like, okay, how are we going to handle this? Mm -hmm. This week's episode is sponsored by Teen Counseling. Teen Counseling is an online therapy program with over 14,000 licensed therapists in their network. They offer support on things like depression, anxiety, relationships, trauma, substance use, and more. This is a great way to get professional support and insight on your relationships, whether you're struggling with conflict or you want to be more effective or advocate for your needs, whatever it is, working with a professional or a therapist can be so helpful and it was a game changer for me to improve my relationship with my parents, with my friends, all of these things, so beneficial. So Teen Counseling offers text, talk, and video counseling all from your home. So what you're going to do is you're going to go to teencounseling.com slash she persisted. You're going to fill out a super quick survey about what you want to focus on in therapy. They're going to send a consent link to your parents, and I tested the email. I sent it to myself. Basically, all it says is Sadie, or whatever your name is, is interested in meeting with a clinician from Teen Counseling. Please learn more here and give consent to treatment. So none of your information that you filled out in your survey about what you want to work on is disclosed. Your parent just gives consent for you to work with a therapist and from there you're matched with a therapist that meets your needs and goals and you start working via talk text and video counseling this is perfect if you need immediate support and don't want to have to navigate the overwhelming experience of going and meeting in person with a therapist for the first time so i highly recommend again if you're looking for support on things like depression anxiety relationships trauma substance use and so much more head to teencounseling.com slash she persisted Again, that's teencounseling.com slash she persisted to get started today. So kind of leading into that, working with couples, that kind of thing, what makes a romantic relationship healthy? What are the things that you're looking for and that that make that an effective experience, relationship, all of those things? Yeah, I think there's a lot of things. I'd be interested to hear what you, (laughs) what would go on your (laughs) list. But one of them that I think, I don't know how you'd, how you build a healthy relationship without this, a big one is trust, right? So trust is basically like an energetic shortcut, right? Trust Mm -hmm. is when you say something to me, I'm like, yeah, that tracks versus, well, she said that, but she has a look on her face and maybe I should take a look at her phone and maybe I should ask my friend, her friends. And I don't really think that was true. And something in my gut doesn't feel right which is just exhausting. It just, you know, to be, there are things that are challenging about being in a intimate relationship. There's a lot of negotiation and navigation and stuff that at least if you have trust, if you at least have a sense that like your words match your actions, then that at least creates ease, right? Mm -hmm. And, And when there's a breach of trust or when it's difficult to trust, it just makes, it's really hard to feel like you have a good, healthy, strong relationship. So trust is a big one. Mm -hmm. I completely agree with you. Trust and communication is the foundation that you need and everything else just gets so much more difficult without that. The flip side of that coin, what are the red flags there that make a relationship feel or be unhealthy? 
Yeah. Yeah. You know, and Sadie, your point about communication is a is a good one because when somebody calls for couples therapy, what they tell me is they're having communication problems. Mm-hmm. But I don't really know what that means, right? Because there's a lot in communication that's about – but basically, I think what you're getting at is the idea that if I have a concern that I can bring it to you and you will say, okay – that makes sense that it's a concern. Let's figure out what we can do about it. You may not agree with my concern, yeah. but you will at least validate that if I have a concern, it's worthy of your consideration mm-hmm. and it's worthy of us trying to figure out. Just that's- that that will be reciprocated. So your partner will come to you if they have a concern instead of just letting it lay dormant and then blow up in some way. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because some, sometimes we don't know that our partner is upset, either because yeah. we're kind of lost in our own world or they have a really good poker face. Mm-hmm. And right, there's the research has found that happy couples have what's called a low negativity threshold, meaning that they, they'll bring up the pebble in the shoe mm-hmm. rather than waiting until it's like a totally like festering wound and then being like, you know, like a, a 10 out of 10 in upset when that's really hard to deal with. And then there's been so many things. Like, I didn't know you've been like building this up for two weeks. Yeah. And I'm only just hearing about it now. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. so interesting. So lack of communication there, the lack of trust. Oh, right. Are there mm-hmm. other things, whether it's like dynamics, like communication patterns, behaviors that you you hear, you see, and you're like, oh, that's not good. Yeah. I really, you know, I think I don't talk a lot about like red flags living inside of a person. Like I know there's like a lot of a lot of that of like uh oh that. But I think it's more like the patterns. It also is. I also want people. I want your audience to really focus on like what are the red flags that happen inside of me? Like and it might be things like I'm silencing myself. I'm saying yes when I mean no. I am lying. Mm -hmm. I am cheating. Right. I am escalating. I am threatening. Those kinds of like those, those kinds of things that indicate within me that I don't feel safe or that I'm not valuing this person, right? Mm-hmm. So there's or like relational patterns become like red flag patterns, and so certainly things like you know patterns of dishonesty, like kind of goes back to the trust mm-hmm. issue. I really, you know, I worry. I think a lot with college students about just not tolerating like early signs of abuse. Those are things I think you know part of college relationships. What what I want for young people is to have early relationship experiences where they have a sense of like kind of the arc, you know, how mm-hmm. to start, what it feels like, how to end. I think realistically, we probably aren't going to marry the first person we fall in love with. Yeah. So we will have to learn how to end well, how to end gracefully, how to heal and how to open up again. So that whole arc is really is really important. And a relationship that ends doesn't mean that it was bad. It doesn't mean that it was a waste of time because there's always going to be learning that then you figure out, okay, so what does that tell me about what I need and want, Mm -hmm. what some of my challenges might be? Sometimes we don't, you know, a lot of us have wounds from childhood or from earlier adolescence that we haven't attended to, especially if we're high achieving, ambitious. We're just like, okay, I'll just keep going. I'll score some A's and just keep on Mm -hmm. going. And it's sometimes not until we've fallen in love with somebody that we're like, oh, shit. Yeah. I've got serious trust Mm -hmm. issues. I have actually a really hard time regulating my emotions. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I don't know how to ask for what I need in the bedroom with somebody who actually mm-hmm. loves me and is like, I want to feel good with you. I want you to feel good with me. It's so sometimes it is in falling in love that we get really confronted by our yeah. own stuff. We grow so much in relationships. I think it's very easy to be able to effectively navigate your own emotions. Like I feel like I've gotten that down to a science, but when you're interacting with other people, that's when you're outside of your comfort zone and you are really, really forced to to leave that comfort of those belief systems and behaviors and patterns. And that's when you're you're pushed out of your comfort zone, you're growing and you're you're evolving and for good or for bad. Mm-hmm. And then in your next relationship, that growth goes with you and you you continue to grow and evolve until you you meet a partner where you you feel like your best version of yourself. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And when you're at a point I think, you know, I teach college seniors mostly. And so one of the things that's really challenging when they come to office hours, one of the things that we commonly are talking about is like, I really, really like this person. And I really like am thinking about, you know, coordinating my next move with this person or trying long distance. And what gets confusing is 
that that there's a transition inside of the self. It's like, oh my God, I'm actually at a point in my life where that's not silly. That's not foolish. Like I am old mm-hmm. enough to make those kinds of choices for myself. And the research shows that the quality of our intimate partnerships is a big, big, big factor on the quality of our overall health and happiness. Mm-hmm. So it's not foolish to be like, I really like this person and I want to try to coordinate a next chapter with them. Not knowing whether or not we're going to last or not last, but there's a kind of internal self-organization that has to happen where it's like, I'm not just a silly little teen. Not that teens are silly. I'm mm-hmm. not saying that. But oftentimes, we will look back and say that my teen love story was silly or foolish, even mm-hmm. though it wasn't. It was the absolute. It wasn't like, long term, but that's okay. You know, but it, it was the it was the amount that you could experience at that time. Yes. But that transition to more of like an adult to adult relationship is like, oh my god, I have to kind of like feel into the fact that I'm actually able to make these choices for myself and I'm not being silly. And sometimes it doesn't help because sometimes people's parents are saying, you know, <laughs> you're too young or you yeah. shouldn't or your career should come first. You know, it just doesn't help. Yeah. This week's episode is brought to you by Sakara. Sakara is a nutrition company that focuses on overall wellness, starting with what you eat. So if you're familiar with She Persisted and my view on mental health, you know I think it's so important to make sure you're taking care of your physical health to not add emotional vulnerability to your mental health. This means getting enough sleep, having good nutrition, getting outside and moving your body. All of these things are crucial. Sakara makes organic, ready-to-eat meals that are made with powerful plant-based ingredients. They're designed to boost your energy, improve digestion, and get your skin glowing. Their meals are delivered all around the U.S. to eat at your door. They also have amazing wellness essentials like Sleepy Time Tea, which is one of my all-time favorites for my night routine. My other favorite product of theirs is their breakfast. You don't have to actually order like breakfast, lunch, and dinner in your meal plan. You can just do certain meals. Their breakfasts are so good. They have different granolas. They have waffles. Like, you name it, and it's so good, plant-based, protein-packed, an amazing way to start your day and fast, too, because you don't have to cook and make a giant breakfast. They have so many other supplements, teas, powders powders, granola, you name it. So if you want to get your hands on these amazing products, you can head to sakara.com and use code XOSADY at checkout for 20% off your first order. Again, that's sakara.com and use code XOSADY at checkout for 20% off. So when you look at healthy relationships in adulthood, what can you pinpoint that has gone right in teenage years and adolescence, whether it's this person effectively explored their boundaries, this person effectively understands their sexuality, what has gone in a good direction as far as that development. Ooh, it's so interesting. It's a it's a kind of Um, kind of vague, kind of abstract, but I'm sure there's a couple patterns where you're like, oh, maybe that is a theme. But yeah. Well, okay. So I guess what I would say is if there has been a really painful experience in adolescence, like Mm -hmm. a trauma within a relationship, like sexual violence or violence or um, abandonment or cheating or like that that the person has had the kind of care they need in the wake mm-hmm. of that in order to integrate it, learn boundaries and those kinds of things in order to go on to the next step. So I would never, ever, ever say that like a bad experience in adolescence just like screws you for the rest mm-hmm. of your life, right? That's not how trauma works. Yeah. Trauma becomes problematic when it's not healed and honored and integrated. Mm-hmm. So the, my worst case scenario is that somebody has a really painful relationship in adolescence that they just bury yeah, and, and then try yeah. to love again. Because, because right, the stuff that we bury – comes back to haunt us Always. in our in our next relationship. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But what I would love, I mean, what I would, if I could like write somebody's story, I would love for them to have relationships in high school and the early years of college where they just feel like they get to, yeah, be playful, be present, learn some kind of basic skills around mutual respect, around like my needs, your needs, our needs, kind of how to handle like time with friends and time with each other because those things are still, right? Like tonight I'm trying to figure out, like my yeah. husband doesn't want to go out. I do want to go out. Like mm-hmm. how am I going to balance that, right? So it doesn't doesn't go away. It just kind of transforms. Mm-hmm. So those are like the early lessons of like how do I love you without losing me? How do I ask for what I need? How do I uh, trust? Coming up against trust again. So those are kinds of – and, and then to like allow – the story to come to a close, like to know that, okay, that relationship ended. They get a special place in my heart, but I'm not going to spend the rest of my life 
looking in the rearview mirror. I'm going to meet the next person on the next person's terms and not compare them to the last person yeah, yeah. and not believe not believe that this love story is somehow worse than the other love story. Like to just know there's lots and lots of ways of falling in love. I oftentimes say some of us fall in love, some of us like step in love, right? We just like <laughs> step very slowly. Like- and there's not better, there's not better and worse ways. But I think that's that's one of the risks is that we will kind of like look back at our earlier stories and kind of compare our later stories, which isn't fair because we aren't who we used to be. Mm-hmm. And, you know, our current partner isn't our last partner. Random off topic. Do you believe that people have like one true soulmate or do you believe that people in our lives for like a reason, a season, a lifetime, different purposes? What's your philosophy there? Yeah. I, when I wrote Loving Bravely, which is my first book, I did a whole – so Loving Bravely is 20 lessons of self-discovery. So mm-hmm. it's 20 different lessons about understanding who you are and the kind of patterns and expectations that you bring into relationships. And I had to do a whole chapter on soulmates because yeah. because that question comes up so much. It's again, and it, messaging it, we receive is you will find a soulmate, you have a soulmate. It's, it's just part of – growing up like all the fairy tales that you read and the stories it's just it's so present in our messaging that's right that's right yep I I want to hear your take also but I I believe that we make soulmates that we Mm -hmm. that that you know through going through experiences together I think we also have lots my best friend who's been my best friend since we were 10 she's my soulmate Mm -hmm. for sure I can't like talk about her without like tears filling my eyes like she like she is in my soul like our souls are you know, like so, so, like her soul is so important to me. Like mm-hmm. that's the, so. There's, I think, there's different like quality, like different relationships that have that kind of soul depth quality. And I think an intimate partnership. So I don't, no, I don't think there is one true partner. I think there's probably are a handful of people with whom you could create a beautiful life. And with this person, you'd have like amazing sex, but like really painful. Like you wouldn't have the same like worldview stuff. And mm-hmm. over here, you have like completely fine sex and you have so much alignment on these things, you know, so there's, I think, different, different things. And so I think that's why it's really important to be clear on what's most important to you. And so then you can like cultivate that and and assess, you know, Mm -hmm. how much somebody is, is meeting you there. But tell me what you think. I really like what you said about creating a soulmate. And I think it's totally true. Like you could walk by your quote unquote soulmate, but if you never talk to them or foster that relationship, like that's a dud, that's a write off. Like that's not your, you wouldn't think that's your soulmate. So I think it's really like what you're putting into relationships, how you're investing in them, how you, how you've invested in yourself to bring the, the best version of yourself to that relationship. And I, I also really agree with you there on friendships that there's so many people that will feed different parts of our souls and that we're deeply, deeply connected with for different reasons during different seasons of our lives and so I think the idea of a soulmate is a truly super deep connection and I think that's possible with multiple different people but I think because it's so rare that we're so deeply connected with people that's why people are like oh you have one soulmate or that's only one person out there but I I think it's just how much you're investing in yourself and the relationship and and feeding that and letting it grow over time I think that's right Yep. Yes. That idea. I think it's, yeah, there's something about a soulmate that it's like a desire to bypass the work. The work. <laughs> totally. Totally. It's like Which an is easy solution. Everyone wants yeah. it. Like add to yeah. Amazon cart. <laughs> that's right. I will take one soulmate. Thank yep, you very deliver much. Deliver next Tuesday. A- expedite shipping. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> there was a research study that was assessed college students on the degree to which they believed in soulmate, like the idea of soulmates. Mm-hmm. And the higher, the more strongly you believed in the idea of a soulmate, the the more the more likely you were to break up with somebody. The more <laughs> likely you were to have, and the more likely you were to be like unable to deal with conflict, which makes sense. Yeah. If you believe it's your soulmate, then it'd be like, oh my god, why are we disagreeing on this? Because you're yeah. supposed to be my soulmate. And, <laughs> yeah, um, it's like soulmates versus compatibility. I think like your your deep connection and long term relationships come from that compatibility and belief systems and values, and mm-hmm. and you you think there's this one perfect package of a person that'll be like check 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 all these boxes. But if you have that baseline compatibility on belief systems, you have similar goals and you put in the work and the time, like there is that idea of that deep soul connection that that can be built and fostered and maintained. 
Absolutely. But I, th- and I think the other thing that the soulmate belief does is it kind of reflects the way that we kind of overburden intimate relationships. Yeah. Like we want that person to be our best friend and our lover and our partner and our co-parent and sometimes our business partner. Mm-hmm. So we put a, we heap a lot of expectations. People have argued that especially in this day and age, we heap so many – like we have really put – intimate partnership is like the center of the world yeah. where other cult- other cultures and other times have put other kinds of relationships at the center, right? The parent-child relationship mm-hmm. is the center and everything else is accessory. Or in some parts of the world, the sibling relationship is central mm-hmm. and then the, uh, everything else is, you know, or the w- relationship among women, like mm-hmm. women and sisters and aunties, right, is the most central thing. But because we have, we've held up intimate partnership as like the end all be all thing, we forget that actually we need a village. Like we need, you know, my marriage is stronger because every single Thursday I meet with a group of women and we do like deep soul work together Mm -hmm. and I bring Mm -hmm. a lot of stuff to them. I worked with them last night on an issue that I'm having in my relationship with our teen daughter. I did deep soul work on that issue. And that unburdens Todd, right? Yeah. He doesn't have to carry that with me. Like I am, I'm well resourced in lots of places, and that's good for our marriage. In I mean, fact, I think when that's I meet, such a common mistake that you navigate in teenage years is your significant other becomes your only support system. You're like, okay, this is not, this doesn't work. That's right. You you learn as you grow, and the relationships teach you things. I think that's so true. Mm-hmm. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So I want to touch on specifically in in females, though, again, we talked about gender being a spectrum, being sexual versus feeling sexualized. And I really loved how you talked about this. And I kind of wanted to explore the difference there and how that impacts sexuality and and relationships as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you're talking about my second book, which is called Taking Sexy Back, which Mm -hmm. is where it is a deep dive for um, a woman, somebody who's been socialized in the feminine to really understand all of the messages that she has been absorbing since she was little so that she can figure out the messages that work for her, that take her more deeply into herself, mm-hmm. that take her – that 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 amplify self-compassion, that amplify pleasure, and to figure out the messages that that don't, the messages that shrink her, the messages that take her out of connection with herself. So it, it's a journey in, you know, for a woman about her relationship with her sexuality. And that's one of the places we start is that our bodies are sexualized so early on. Oftentimes, our bodies are sexualized before we've even had a chance to understand what the hell our sexuality is is about, yeah. right? So that we experience our bodies as something that is to be looked at, to be touched, to um, make somebody else feel good. And it does not set us up well to enter erotic experiences feeling like, okay, so this erotic experience is going to be about both of us feeling good and creating something together, right? Mm -hmm. Which is really – so that's the difference. So feeling sexual is feeling connected to your own body, connected to what would feel good? What do I want to feel in this experience? Mm -hmm. Versus sexualized is like how do I position myself so that my partner enjoys themselves? Yeah. Right? And I think that's such a significant distinction that we we kind of intertwine the two and we forget that they're different. And I think it's so important to highlight and illustrate that those are separate entities and different experiences that we have. Right. That's right. Yeah. And and sometimes it is. Sometimes there are – sometimes a particular behavior or a particular position – it's like what feels good about this is I know how good it's making you feel. Mm-hmm. So there is something about like a feedback loop, right? Like not yeah. every single behavior – sometimes sometimes what feels pleasurable is witnessing your pleasure. So mm-hmm. I don't want to discount that. But oftentimes, I think especially for college-age women, emerging adult women, it is about the idea that like I have to kind of continue to position myself or sound partic- – make particular sounds – look a particular way, do particular things so that you feel good. Mm-hmm. It's it's mm-hmm. so much focused on a performance. Yeah. Um, which I think I think the you know, the availability of twenty four seven free streaming porn and the fact that especially if you are partnering with a guy, you have a sense that probably this is what they've seen, this is mm-hmm. what they view as normal. So it's all that kind of stuff is like right there in, you know, in the bedroom with a woman and it makes it really hard then to go from a place of like mindfulness, which is the mm-hmm. best place to go to have a good sexual experience is like just being present and mindful to how am I doing? How are you doing? And it's like a, it's like a, 
a back and forth. Mm -hmm. That was exactly my next question, which was pornography. Do you see a Mm -hmm. negative and positive isn't the right word, but on teenagers specifically, what are your thoughts there? Yeah. We're just, I mean, it's a radically, radically different world like you all are on the like leading edge you're among the yeah. first you know first generation of people who have grown up with all of this free streaming like really like like that porn and hardcore porn are basically the same thing at this point what is normalized you know, if you looked at it's actually kind of an interesting sociological study to look at porn from like the 70s and mm-hmm. the 80s like it just the what was what was the spectrum was so much more limited like what was yeah. sort of and I don't, you know, I never want to get into like yucking someone else's yum, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but I think that for young people to be consuming a lot of hard, like to be watching hardcore, for any of us to be watching hardcore porn, those messages get in. And I think that there are, I know there are lots of people who love like more extreme kinds of sexuality, like mixing pleasure and pain. I think we have a ton. I'm always trying to learn from the kink community. And I think there's mm-hmm. like really cool, important stuff to say about power and how you navigate like the intersection of pleasure and pain. But that's not what we're seeing in heart. We're not watching in hardcore porn, people really intentionally and mindfully doing power exchange and like titrating bits of pain with their pleasure, right? We're watching things that for many, many of us would feel uncomfortable Mm -hmm. or unpleasurable or um, vulnerable and self we people feel self self conscious. Mm-hmm. So I do think that it. I think it lands. I think it matters. I really want people to be thoughtful about what they consume. I love this website called Make Love Not Porn, which is like basically like the world's first social network. It's basically like Facebook for sex, like where people <laughs> are sh- like real live couples and real live individuals are sharing their sex videos. So you're watching like regular bodies, inclusive mm-hmm. bodies, like real people, actual couples, like having sex together or having solo sex. It just is so much more. It's a funny thing to say it's wholesome, mm-hmm. but it's so wholesome yeah. in that you're seeing relationships. So I really want people to be mindful. I also love Erica Lust is a feminist pornographer. Okay. And so her her films, and unfortunately, nearly all of the like quote unquote good stuff, the feminist mm-hmm. stuff, the inclusive stuff, ends up being behind a paywall. Mm-hmm. But I think that it's, I think if people can afford to spend a bit, if they're going to be using erotica, I think it's worth spending a little bit of money to really consume images of that are relational, that mm-hmm. are where where there's been care in creating it, right? I think that's part of the problem is just also like the degradation of yeah. performers and people, you know, so then you're like, you're consuming content where the people weren't being treated well, they weren't being treated fairly, they weren't paid well. So it's just sort of like this weird energetic exchange then where you just like got yourself off on something that was not lovingly created, you know, it just sort mm-hmm. of I struggle with a lot of it. But tell me what you think. What's your... No, I, I, I completely agree. And it like makes me immediately think of the fast fashion movement where it's like, being very intentional about the content you're consuming, where you're buying from, all of these different things. And it's it's all connected. And I think that that makes it a ton of sense. And I'm always talking about being a critical consumer on social media and what's boosting your mood and making you feel good. And I think that's exactly true here, being mindful of your experience and and not feeling pressured or forced to consume certain content because it's what other people are doing. And so again, mindfulness of your experience, um, and and being critical to make it the best possible experience for you that that you can but for wait one more thing yes. Sadie about sorry one more thing about about porn that I think is really important because you all had access to smartphones at a really really early age mm-hmm. it means that like the average age of seeing porn is like maybe thirteen right Which like the, like starting to see yeah yeah so what it means is that and this is true for guys and girls I think it sometimes is a little bit more true of guys, Mm -hmm. that they oftentimes then um, watching porn as actually one of their first self-soothing strategies. And so so it can feel like it can feel like this very private, very secret thing that I used to, you know, like where his story is like, this is what I did when my parents were fighting and I was really scared. I would go to this place and make my body feel good. Mm -hmm. And so there's like, like, there's something then, and then later on, when he's in a relationship and she's struggling with his use of porn and she's critical of him and she's judgmental of him, mm-hmm. There's it can this feel whole other again. Like, she's not aware. This whole other yeah. narrative where, where I want to like be whispering in her ear, like, listen, like it doesn't mean that it's okay. And he and he does need some different strategies now mm-hmm. that he's a man, now that he's not living with parents who are fighting. But I also want 
her to have a ton of empathy for and understanding the of that new story. Ones. Yeah, totally. Yeah. I think that makes a ton, a ton of sense. For parents that are looking to be a supportive resource and offer a more effective education than what we initially talked about in the public school system, what is your advice there? Is it certain resources? Is it having a certain conversation? What's your tips and tricks? There are some really wonderful sex educators who are very helpful to parents. One I can think of off the top of my head is Sex Positive Families is one. Okay. Nadine Thornhill. Jen, Dr. Jen Littner mm-hmm. has an e-course for parents about, about sex and gender. She's right, created in a really inclusive way. Mm-hmm. So there are some really there are really good resources out there, but parents need to do a bit of legwork on their own. And I think that, you know, it's kind of it's cool that like when people when when kids are little, I also I have a I have a really big blog on my website. Mm-hmm. And in my blog I wrote an article a few years ago about resources for parents. Okay, about awesome. I'll link that in the show. Notes. And, yeah. Okay, cool. Um but basically, you know, from a very early age, we can be teaching our kids about bodily autonomy. We can be using the, the correct names for mm-hmm. genitals. We can be asking, like, you know, even with like our little babies, like, I'm going to take off your diaper now, like kind of telling them what like mm-hmm. the sort of like the idea of consent that even that we can kind of, when, our, when we're interfacing with our bodies, like letting them know in really small, subtle ways that your body is yours, right? Rather than like, go hug, you know, Uncle Harold. It's like, Do you want to give Uncle Harold a hug, Mm -hmm. a handshake, a high five, or a wave? Like just those little micro lessons that are about bodily autonomy and consent where we're giving kids a chance to check in with themselves. Like what's a yes and what's a no and who do I want to touch and who do I want to have touch me? That those are – and they're not even about – so sex is – you know sex education is bigger and broader than Mm -hmm. just like what you were saying before, like preventing pregnancy. It's also about like just feeling your own sovereignty. Yeah. I love that. And I think that's so, so important. Resources to leave listeners with if they want to further understand relationships, healthy relationships, that relationships, sexuality, all of those things. What are your recommendations? Well, so certainly we just mentioned the blog on my website. Mm-hmm. I'm active on I'm active on social media, so at dr.alexandra.solomon Amazing. on Instagram. I have a whole e-course. I turned the Marriage 101 class at Northwestern into an e- sort of like Marriage 101 for the grown and sexy. Mm-hmm. It's a big comprehensive foundational sex and relationship course it. you can find on my website. On my blog, I have like a series of articles that are like my top 10 favorite books about parenting, my top 10 favorite books about relationships. Mm-hmm. So okay, perfect. there's some of those. Mm-hmm. But yeah, there's lots. I mean, it's, it's we are living and loving in a time where there's just a lot of resources available, which is really wonderful. Mm-hmm. And I like the point that you made a bit ago about being a mindful consumer of social media. And so if you're going to be on Instagram, rather than looking at things that make you feel crappy about yourself, it's yeah. a really wonderful. There are a lot of therapists who have robust Instagram feeds where they're giving really good self-help and relationship content. Awesome. Well, thank you so, so much for sitting down with me. I know this conversation will be so helpful for so many teens and parents alike, just understanding their their relationships, their sexuality, all of that. So thank you so, so much. Thank you so much for having me, Sadie. It was fun to talk with you. Talk with you. In case you skip to the end, to recap this week's episode, Dr. Solomon and I talked about the difference in messaging between teenage girls and boys during adolescence and the long-term impacts that this causes. We talk about the connection between body image and sexual health. We dive into sexuality in teens, healthy versus unhealthy relationships, what occurs in teenage years that leads to healthy relationships in adulthood. We discuss red flags in relationships. We talk about being sexual versus feeling sexualized. We talk about resources for parents who want to be a helpful resource for their teens as they develop sexuality and understand their relationships. And we talk about additional resources for teens about relationships, connection, sexuality, all of that. If you enjoyed this week's episode, please, please share with a friend or family member. It helps the podcast out so much. Make sure you're subscribed, left a review, follow on Instagram at She Persisted Podcast. I hope you loved this interview as much as I did, and I will see you next Monday.